We are super excited for this event. We have a tremendous panel of speakers. We just got the music. And we'll be good. Good evening, everybody. My name is Aaron Shasha. I'm the Young Adult Program Director for the SCA. It's a pleasure and an honor to have everybody here tonight for a beautiful event. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our hosts for this evening, Ness and Claudine Hedef. Thank you so much for opening your homes. The extended Hedef family, David and Monica Hedef, thank you so much for opening your home. This is a beautiful night and a beautiful home, and we can't thank you enough for your hospitality. I'd like to also start off by thanking the SCA for allowing myself and my committee to put together meaningful programming for our community. It starts with our president, Jeffrey Beta. Round of applause for Jeffrey. The Young Adult Committee, Irene Hannon and Yvette Hittery, thank you so much for all of the tremendous hard work that you do. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for the night, Joey and Raquel Franco. Thank you for allowing the night to be what it is. The SCA Young, Ad Young Adult Division at its core is designed to help our young adult community members embrace and be proud of their Jewish identity. And we are attempting to do that in a number of ways. We've already started with some meaningful programs. Some of you might have already participated in them. We had an SCA boot campus for high school seniors. We have uh, weekly going on through the summer a Minhad, a message program where every Shabbat we have young adults who come from Minhad Gedola and here in Torah class every Shabbat. And just to show you a little bit of a flavor of what the SCA Young Adult Division has already been doing, we'd like to show you a film of the SCA Boot Campus in action. Just to give you guys an understanding about what we're about and what we're looking to accomplish here for our community young adults. So welcome everybody to the first annual Boot Campus. Boot Campus Retreat is for seniors in high school and it's to prepare them in an intensive way for the various challenges that they're going to find in the post high school world. It's a few days of fun, learning, understanding your Jewish heritage, learning about the issues that Israel and the Jewish community faces and being empowered and emboldened. We're all really in a bubble. Next year, when we step out of that bubble, we're gonna see a lot more of what the real world has to offer. When students come to campus, they're faced with a lot of things. Oh, oh, if I had a program like this, it could have been a complete game changer when I was on campus. We have world-class experts. We address many topics like social media literacy, wokeism, anti-Semitism, identity, Jewish values, Sephardic pride, all the things that we feel will help for our values to persist into the future. Everyone here was so interested in learning, and I think that's what made the experience so great. It's very fun. I love it. I'm learning a lot. It's very informative. This retreat really opened my eyes to a new perspective on the Arctic Jewish Syrian experience, how we stay so connected to our heritage and how our community lasted so long. I think my favorite was the APAC speech that we had earlier. It just shows us if you reach out, you can get involved and you can make a difference. My favorite thing was being able to actually ask questions. Usually you're, you're listening to someone speak and then they're done, or it's rare that you get an opportunity to ask like, people like, questions. You'd never imagine the kids in this stage of life are so interested and so engaged that after the session is over, they're bombarding the speaker, asking questions. I loved hearing about Adela because just to show that, like, don't stand on the side if we aren't treated right. Like, you could make a difference alone. We go from a serious atmosphere in our sessions and learning to just these fun activities. The ropes course was my favorite thing ever. The whole trip, it was pretty epic. 
perfect. I love it. Speakers have been incredible. Like it's been a life-changing experience. My favorite part was meeting new people. We're one big family here, and we all have the same interest in standing up for Israel. We need to know as, a, as Jews how to advocate for Israel, especially on college campuses. We brought a team of five professionals from Stand With Us to lead a breakout session about how they can understand anti-Semitism, how they can understand anti-Zionism, how they can navigate different conversations with people they might have on campus. This program is a gift, just to have this space in which you get to be yourself and ask questions and figure things out and talk about who you are as a Sephardic Jew. It's super important to educate members of our community so they can go out into the world and have a voice. Guys, I recommend coming on this trip. You learn a lot and you have so much fun and you meet new people. You gotta come to a retreat like this. It's super fun. You're meeting new friends, you're connecting with your community and learning how you can really help inspire others around you. I would have done anything to have this when I was 18. You will find tools that will prepare you to be so confident going into some of the most exciting four years of your life. The unique thing about boot camp is that no other American Jewish community has taken seriously enough that when its younger members are faced with the challenges as they go on college campuses, they need guidance, they need support, they need to feel like they're not alone. And I hope that every American Jewish community replicates this amazing model. So as you can see, we're off to a fantastic start, but it's just the beginning. We are super committed and excited to continue some of these meaningful programs. Some of them up ahead will be monthly get-togethers in Manhattan, will be continuation of our Minhad message program into the fall and winter, and many other wonderful get-togethers that will allow our community young adults to socialize, get together, for a meaningful topic that helps us to better understand who we are and appreciate better who we are. To help kick off tonight, before we get to the panelists, I'd like to share a story about my first experience when I was in college about 10 years ago to help give context to what this night is all about. So I went to St. John's University. I didn't dorm there, but I was mandated to participate in a two-night orientation on campus. And so I brought lunch for the day, but then after that I was on my own for three days trying to figure out what I was going to eat at a Catholic university. I rummaged through the cafeteria and I found myself with two options for the next three days. Soft serve ice cream and golden grains. And so that was what I was prepared to eat in order to maintain to my tradition and to my values, and so that's what I ate. The first day went by, everything was great, I was okay. The second day got interesting. On the second day, they took us to Manhattan and the goal was to visit one of the churches that was in Manhattan. I made it clear to my superior that I was not permitted to enter into a church, and they said, no problem, we're willing to respect your Jewish values, you can stay off to the side. And so I waited, and I waited, and I waited until my supervisor who was next to me said, you know, you're probably hungry because all I've seen you eat is ice cream and golden grams. Perhaps there's something kosher to eat around here. I didn't really know where I was. I called my uncle. I said, uncle, this is where I am. Can you tell me if there's any kosher food around here? He says, yes, there's amenities two blocks away. You can go get yourself a burger. I said, great. We walked over to Mendy's. I got myself a delicious hamburger with french fries 
and I was good to go. Now on the way back to the church, we passed by Carvel. And my supervisor who's next to me says, you know, I'm gonna stop for ice cream. Hey, you like ice cream, why don't you have with me? I said, no, you see, I can't have because I just had meat. She said, but who cares? So you had meat and now you're gonna have dairy. I do it all the time. I said, no, you know, part of my Jewish values is that we follow certain laws. One of them is not eating dairy after meat. She said, all right, weird. I don't really get it, but you do you, no problem. So we continued onwards for the rest of the day. We got back to campus and at night, we're all eating dinner and guess what my dinner is? Ice cream and golden grams. So I start eating and my supervisor walks over to me and she says, aha, there it is, your favorite ice cream. I know it, let me guess. No meat for you for the next six hours. I said, no, it doesn't really work like that because you see, it's dairy if the meat, not meat if the dairy. She's like, I don't care anymore. You are crazy, you are clinically insane. I don't know how it is you do what you do, but I can't listen to this anymore because it's overwhelming me. And that was really my first taste of leaving our little Syrian community bubble and entering in to the real world. And I have to admit, I felt uncomfortable. I didn't really feel like I belonged. I didn't really feel like everything that I knew that made sense to me was what I thought it was. When we were putting together tonight's program, I was very careful. I did not want to send a mixed message that we are an alarmist organization that is going to say to you that the sky is falling and everything is bad and everything is evil and you have to be on a panic alert. But at the same time, we do have a fundamental responsibility to ourselves to be educated and to be aware and to understand where we are and where we are headed. And to finalize this thought, I want to introduce a thought from this week's parasha. You know, this week's parasha is a continuation of last week where Moshe Rabbeinu is giving us more speeches about how it is that we are supposed to enter into Eretz Israel, And it begs an obvious question. Enough with the speeches. Why do we keep needing to get motivated to go into Eretz Israel? Borei Olam already told us, I'm going to take you in and you're going to be okay. The prior generation wasn't willing to listen. They were punished for it for 40 years. Pretty big deal of a punishment. I'm pretty sure this generation figured it out and they're willing to say, you know, we're not willing to test God this time. Let's just go into the land. And I think it's important for all of us to understand that no matter what is going on in your life, whether you feel like you know the answer, whether it's something that you're supposed to do, yes, Gene Israel, we're destined to go into our homeland, Eretz Israel. But it was still unknown to them, and the fear of that unknown required a conversation. It required awareness about who you are and where are you headed and how are you going to do it. And tonight's panel is an opportunity for us to do just that. To understand who we are as Jews, to understand where it is that we are headed. I don't necessarily have to be on a college campus in order for me to feel like this is important to me. Even if you're headed to Eretz Israel, you might be headed to a Jewish campus, you might be headed into the workforce, and that's all great, but guess what? You take the train, you're going on an airport, you're going to travel in the streets, every single one of us that is here tonight is going to be subjected to something that we need to be prepared and empowered to deal with. And with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our panel, who are really going to introduce themselves and are going to answer the first question of the night. And the first question of the night is, what is your why? Why do you care about anti-Semitism? Why is it important to you? And what advice do you have for our young adults here in the audience? Why should they care about this idea of anti-Semitism? Tamara. Thank you so much, Aaron. I wanted to start by thanking Aaron, Irene, everyone at the SCA for having us here this evening. My name is Tamara Behrens, and I work for an organization called the Tikva Fund. You'll see in front of you that you have some information from the Tikva Fund, so you can put, a, put some faces to the name. 
Um, I'll just tell you briefly what I do with Chick-fil-A, and then I'll go into answering the question that you posed, Aaron, which I think is a really meaningful one to begin with. So I run young professional programs at TICFA. TICFA is an organization that has a whole host of educational and leadership programs for basically middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, through to advanced young professionals. And we recently actually partnered um, with the SCA a few weeks back for another event with Dara Horn. So if any of you were at that event and got a chance to meet Dara, Dara is the kind of speaker that take the brains in front of an audience very frequently. Um, but enough about what I do, that's my day to day. I do want to get into a little bit of my past and really the reason that I'm here speaking on this panel. So as you might be able to hear from my voice, I'm originally from London, England. Um, I grew up in a very different reality to what I imagine most of you grew up with much smaller community, less resources, and in a society that is markedly a little more hostile, unfortunately, than the place that we're living in now. Not that America, unfortunately, doesn't have its problems, but the reason why I'm telling you this is because when I tell you the following story, take it with a grain of salt. I hope that none of you ever have to experience anything close to what I experienced, but I think that what I'll share will um, you know, help kind of help illuminate some of the uh, reasons why it is so important to be a proud Jew when you go out into the world, as Aaron so wonderfully articulated. So I went to King's College London, which is a campus in the heart of London, um, and I was very excited to go. I was excited to begin my education. A few months before I started at this campus, however, there was a major violent protest that broke out against an Israeli speaker that the Israel Club had brought to campus. Um, this speaker, his name is Ami Ayalon, was the former head of the Shin Bet. He, um, he was a big proponent of the two-state solution. He remains a big proponent of the two-state solution. He's someone who is more to the left of the political spectrum, and he was actually brought in to speak by an organization that is pretty leading to the left. It's not an organization that one would assume would ignite a protest. However, the pro-Palestinian camp staged basically a violent, it was almost an insurrection. They threw chairs out the windows, they set off fire alarms, they drowned out the speaker with every means possible and basically created a situation in which the Jewish students had to flee underground through underground tunnels I mean, it was really just unimaginable that this would take place in an institution of higher education. And now this happened right before I was starting to come to campus, and it basically meant that the situation I was walking into was one where all of the Jews on campus felt defeated. They didn't know how to respond to this incident. It wasn't something that the university administrators acted on in the way that they should have. They basically blamed the Israel Club for bringing the speaker. Their argument was, well, we brought a speaker that people were offended by, and that's why they protested so violently, so it's on you, and you shouldn't bring a speaker like that again. And they created a situation in which they tried to prevent us from having any pro-Israel programs throughout the year um, by making it as difficult as they could for us to get approval to bring speakers onto campus. Um, and so that was really my why. I was raised, like I'm sure all of you were, with a very strong moral compass. Um, I was raised modern orthodox. I was taught right and wrong based on Torah values. I had a very clear understanding of what, you know, what right and wrong meant. And I looked at this situation and I saw how Jewish students were being so mistreated in favor of basically a, a violent mob and I just couldn't stand by and let it go on um, without doing anything about it. So my why was really, I see injustice happening in the world. My upbringing and my values teaches me that I need to do something. And as a Jew specifically, being taught so much growing up about the beauty of our tradition, the nobility of our tradition, the Jewish people, Zionism specifically, um, as another part of that story in many ways, um, I just, I couldn't sit by and let this go unchallenged. And I'll add a second why before I wrap up. I think the second why to why I decided to become active on campus 
standing up and I eventually uh, worked for a campus organization supporting all the students as well in the UK. The second why was that I felt like I had uh, a lot to contribute to other Jewish students who maybe didn't know as much about what it means to be Jewish. You know, they didn't grow up having the same Jewish education as I did. Maybe they hadn't been to Israel before. I was on a campus which was very international, and we had Jewish students from countries all around Europe and around the world. And so I encountered a lot of people who were shy about their Jewishness, they were hiding it. And I think I felt in, in a position where someone, being someone who was more educated, having grown up, having family in Israel, visiting Israel on a frequent basis, I have the ability to actually inspire these other Jewish students. And I would imagine that many of you in this room are in a position to do that as well, given you know all the work that the SCA is doing to put on wonderful programming for you. So that's my why, and um, those are my two whys, I guess. And I hope those whys resonate with you. Thank you, Tamara. Dalia, please. Thanks, Tamara and Aaron. Um, first of all, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure being here, and like Tamara, I'm joining all the thank yous of those who invited us and are hosting us here tonight. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit from my past before I get to where I am today. Um, I grew up in Israel my whole life. I was actually born in LA, but at the, when I was one year old, my family went back to Israel, and I really grew up in Israel my whole life. Um, I grew up most of my years in southern Israel, in a small town. You said small town, I probably can compete with you. But it's a small town of about you know, a thousand families uh, near Be'er Sheva in southern Israel. When I grew up, I went to the Scouts. I was like grown in this very, you know, Zionist Israeli family, um, where in Israel being Zionist is different, I guess. Well, not I guess I know from being here because it's kind of obvious. <laughs> you're in Israel, you're Israeli. It is what it is. Um, but I learned how to love my country and know my country through the Israeli Scouts mainly, uh, through walking all the trails and teaching all the values, and then. And then also, when I was in eighth grade, was the first time uh, sirens went off because of rockets from Gaza. So I had to grab my best friend in the hand when I was in eighth grade and run down to the shelter during school, um, realizing that that was not a drill anymore. And growing up in that reality, especially with the knowledge that international reaction is not what you'd expect it to be, made me think a lot about these things. Um, then I went at the age of 18, like all Israelis, to serve in the army. I served in field intelligence. I started as a soldier in uh, the south part of Hebron Mountain, and then when I was a commander, I served near Annapolis. And that really introduced me to the heart of the conflict. Um, I am what other people on call can tell you, I'm the heart of the occupation. <laughs> I was the one who was really uh, deep inside and, and um, it made me know from first hand what type of values this army stands for and what it is that we're there to do. When I finished my service, kind of like all Israelis, I needed to travel, so I went to Central America. That's after being here for two months uh, in a Jewish summer camp. And then Protective Edge happened, and all my friends were in Gaza, and my house was being under attack, and it was so, such a surreal experience to be abroad while this is happening in Israel. And I knew there was no point in going back because they weren't going to take me for reserves at that point. It's a complicated situation, but I, I decided to stay. And once it was done, I started my travels, and this Englishman comes to me and tells me, you know, Hamas is not really a terror organization. And he was blaming Israel. And it was my first encounter with that kind of accusation, I would say. And I found myself researching in the middle of Guatemala in a cafe on Wi-Fi, trying, trying, trying to find sources to prove to him that he wrong. Should I switch my Anyway. Um, and it made me realize how much that mattered to me, how much his view was something that bothered me to my core. So, during my travels, I made a decision that in order to understand why people see Israel the way to do, I need to be in the outside. I can't stay in Israel and try to figure out what people think from the outside. So I made my decision to move to the States and study here. 
Uh, when I moved, I uh, started actually in CUNY in a community college, but my roommates were from Columbia University. And, you know, they started sharing with me what's happening in Columbia, and I decided I'm going to be a, an integral part and co found student supporting Israel's chapter at Columbia University. Uh, almost a year later, I also transferred to Columbia University, and, and I did my BA over there in political science and international relations. But an important thing to understand is that the encounters that Tamara was sharing and are very similar to my own. I mean, we had speakers yell down. We were surrounded by 50 people, if not even more, shouting at us just because they recognized who we were as Israel supporters. Um, we had the press say bluntly anti-Semitic things to other students in front of us. But I also want you to understand that um, I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. And the reason is probably my why, which Aaron asked us to share. Kind of like you are coming from a bubble uh, to an extent of a, of a warm and loving community that you know helps you understand what Zionism is and what being Jewish means. Coming from Israel, I didn't really understand what's the anti-Semitism that's going on here. And my first encounter with that anti-Semitism was college. When I came to America, I suddenly realized what it means to be a Jewish minority, which was something I never knew, obviously being in Israel. So it's walking into a classroom and hearing someone saying, um, talking about real estate issues, and someone is saying, of course, it's all because of the government and the Jews. And that was a shock. Um, and it's all these other experiences such as Tamara was sharing earlier. So I thought to myself, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. They didn't survive what they survived and they didn't go through what they went through in order for me to have the exact same experiences in other places. And that's why they chose to go to Israel. But as long as I choose to live here and as long as that's something that I'm doing, I'm gonna fight and that is my why. No one stood up for them. I'm going to make sure I stand up as long as I'm here. Um, and I think it's so integral for each and every one of you to think about what moves you, what really you know bothers you and makes you care enough in order to be active, in order to not stand aside. Um, so that is my why. And after college, I decided I wanted to continue working with campuses. So. I joined an organization called Manhattan Task Force, um, which is one of the benefits, by the way, of doing college activism. There's a lot to do with it afterwards. Um, but they recruited me from campus, and I continued working with colleges all over the Northeast, and kind of also relating to what Aaron said, not to be an alarmist, every campus is very different. It doesn't mean that there's nothing to do on every campus, I think there is, but make sure that you know that you don't need to be scared of you know, going to campus or being a student, they're gonna be great and amazing times. It's just a very specific component. Um, today I work with Jewish Federation. I am their civic and community engagement director. And I can't tell you enough how much my experiences and the things that I've done and standing up for Israel have led me to where I am today and I couldn't be more grateful. So, thanks. Thanks, Thank Next up is Zach. Uh, is this on? Can you guys hear? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach. Uh, I, unlike the previous two, actually, first I want to reiterate, uh, thank you so much for uh, everyone involved in the planning of this event. It's a gorgeous yard, gorgeous home, and great crowd we have here. Uh, so, my name is Zach. Uh, unlike the two previous speakers, uh, I grew up in the United States and am currently a college student. Uh, I'm a rising senior at Northwestern University right now. Um, and it's difficult for me to pinpoint a time when I first became invested in fighting anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, growing up here in the United States, right, very aware of Israel as a political issue and, and all that's associated with that. But my why comes from being in college. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of take you on a, on a chronological walk through my college experience. So I had you know, been aware that there was anti-Semitism on college campuses before I got to Northwestern. Uh, but my first experience with it was during my freshman year. So this was uh, January of 2020. 
This was right after uh, a spate of anti-Semitic attacks in the New York area, right, culminating in, with that attack in Muncie. Uh, I wrote a piece for our school newspaper basically arguing that anti-Semitism is bad and that people on both sides of the aisle should fight against it. And soon after that piece was published, uh, the newspaper published a letter to the editor written by Students for Justice in Palestine. And that letter essentially read, uh, Zach is Islamophobic, Zach is racist, Zach is sexist, because I mentioned uh, Rashida Tlaib and Elhan Omar in the piece. And uh, strangely enough, Zach is anti-Semitic for conflating anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism that somehow is itself an, an act of anti-Semitism. Uh, so that was my first uh, wake-up call that this isn't, you know, just some theoretical issue that we can, you know, research online and sit at a desk and write papers about, but it's something that will actually affect all of us once we're on a college campus. Uh, the bigger and probably more illustrative example, I guess I have two, that can, I think, pretty, uh, pretty coherently sum up how anti-Semitism exists on college campuses right now. Uh, so fall of 2020, and this is after the, the summer of, of social justice activism, right? Uh, everybody is posting things on their Instagram stories. Uh, you know, everybody's very invested and very angry about a lot of stuff going on in the country. Uh, and there's a group at Northwestern that wants to abolish campus police. Uh, they start having rallies, which eventually, you know, unsurprisingly turn destructive, uh, and demonstrate outside the president of the school's house at midnight. Now, the president of the school is Jewish. He's an observant, uh, you know, more or less observant supporter of Israel. Uh, and the protesters were chanting a slogan at him. Uh, his name is Morty, Piggy Morty. Right, and though they explain themselves as saying that has to do with the, you know, uh, with the police being referred to as pigs, he felt that there were at least undertones of anti-Semitism with that, which is entirely understandable, and there may very well have been undertones of anti-Semitism there. So he puts out a statement condemning the, you know, people congregating on his front lawn at midnight, and also the chanting. And in response, the organization that wanted to uh, abolish campus security put out their own statement. And they said, you know, while we didn't mean it like that, Israel's an apartheid state and every uh, social justice movement must also, also work for the abolition of the state of Israel. So that, I think, really encapsulates how a lot of this, oh, and I'll wait until the train passes. All right, I think we're good. So that statement that they put out also mentioned how, uh, you know, uh, Morty Shapiro, the school president, like uh, many other Jews, is, uh, you know, is, is in power as a figure of white supremacy. Uh, and so that demonstrates how this sort of uh, wokeness, right, that, that, that you mentioned earlier, uh, is uh, so tied hand in hand right now with anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism on college campuses, right? It's all part of, from the point of view of the campus activists, the same battle. Uh, the second uh, why event that I have was pretty recent. Uh, it was this past spring. Now, uh, Northwestern has a boulder on its campus uh, that is used for student organizations to advertise events that they're having. And one day, this past April, Students for Justice in Palestine painted the slogan, uh, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with it, but some of you may be, from the river to the sea. Now, what that calls for is the elimination of the state of Israel and in its place a Palestinian state, right? It is necessarily anti-Semitic because it calls for ethnic cleansing. Uh, so they, they painted this slogan on the rock. And I, you know, I was waiting. I was waiting for Hillel to make a statement, right? That is by far the largest Jewish organization on our campus. And they didn't. Uh, and so I looked at their website, 
And I saw that that same week they were holding an event with J Street U at Northwestern called Occupation 101, right? Referring to Israel as an occupation state, uh, having a guest who talks about apartheid and how Gaza is an open air prison and all that. And so I learned that we can't always rely on people who we think might be our allies for that sort of support. So I think that, that that led me to my biggest why, which I guess the smaller one comes out of that second episode, which is it's very important for us to actually actively seek out people who are on our side. Uh, it's important when you go into college to look for people who you agree with. While it's also important to find people you disagree with, it's important to have this uh, you know, a, a circle of people who feel the same way about you and are also committed to opposing anti-Semitism in all its forms. But the bigger why for me was that I learned that, you know, contrary to that old belief that once these kids graduate college and are in the real world, they'll understand how things really are, that's not what happens. They're not disabused of this sort of thinking by the time they enter the workforce. These are people, you know, the, the student newspaper that gave favorable coverage to Students for Justice in Palestine and didn't interview any opposing voices on that issue, they're working at the New York Times after graduating. Uh, people are working at the UN after graduating and coming up with anti-Israel resolutions. They're going to amnesty and writing blatantly anti-Semitic uh, reports about Israel filled with lies. So that made me understand that in order to counter that, there has to be a network of young Jews who are willing to enter the fight, who want to stand up against anti-Semites to enter industries where they can have an impact. Uh, that is the biggest why, that I recognize that that is what we have to do to fight this issue. Thank you, Zach. So Zach, you mentioned this idea of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. We'll jump ahead simply because you mentioned it now. Could you help the audience understand what do those terms mean, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, and can one be anti-Zionist and not be anti-Semitic? We'll start with them. Um, so I think it's a very important question and the way I see it is, what is Zionism? I think we first need to define what Zionism means in order for us to understand whether something can be anti or, or whatever. And to me, Zionism is the right of the Jewish people to live in their indigenous historical homeland. And if that is the case, and I hope you all agree with me, and if anyone has any thoughts or questions about it, talk to me. But if that is the case, and you find everyone around you being supportive of every other indigenous right and then of your other people's right to have their, their homeland or, or state, then being anti only for the Jewish state and their right to be their indigenous homeland is necessarily being anti-Jewish. Um, and I, I'll give an example of something that happened on campus um, that relates we were we had a habit one of the things that we used to do is go to anti-israel events usually be in the back listen respectfully and then ask questions to kind of like you know negate the points that were being said in that anti-israel event and one of those events was called um zionism and anti-semitism and it was basically led by an anti-semitic professor who was of course not jewish or a zionist and i remember telling him my question was how can you not Jewish, not Zionist, be in a room telling everyone what anti-Semitism is and what Zionism is with no Jew or Zionist next to you confirming, confirming or negating what you're saying. No other minority would have to stand for this. So why do we? And I think that's where it matters. We need to be the ones telling our own narrative. We need to be the ones dictating what Zionism is, what anti-Semitism is, just like every other minority has that right. So that's my answer to that. Thank you. I think that's a really great answer and it's an important question. Um, I will say that I don't think there's a distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism at all, and I'll tell you why. So anti-Semitism at its core is a political tool 
it's not just a form of regular discrimination, it's actually a political tool to render the Jews powerless, to basically debase the Jews to the point that they are a minority in the way that Jews were a minority in the diaspora for millennia, living mostly you know, small lives, separated from their homeland, and unable to flourish. The goal of anti-Semitism, in my opinion, is to return the Jews to that position. So before the establishment of the State of Israel, at a time where the Jews were still dispersed across the diaspora, the way that anti-Semitism would manifest, meaning the political tools being used against the Jews, was to make sure that the Jew couldn't participate in domestic Western society. So to make arguments against you know, Jews being able to vote, or to you know, sit in Congress, or to participate in business or the arts. That was the argument at that time. And then you have something really miraculous. You have the establishment of the State of Israel. And you also have the Holocaust and obviously all of the tragedy that ensued from that. And you basically have this demographic upheaval where now most of the world's Jews are concentrated in Israel and America. But most fundamentally, the most important center of Jewish life is now in Israel. And so what do the anti-Semites do? They turn to Israel. They say the way to disarm the Jews, the way to demonize the Jews, make the Jews feel small and powerless, now we have to focus all of our resources on the state of Israel. So really I think the distinction between, or trying to create a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism can be somewhat unhelpful. I think that really anti-Zionism is just the latest manifestation of anti-Semitism. And the problem is that unfortunately the anti-Semites are very clever. They know how to get us where it hits. They have managed to kind of marry this anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism with the modern progressive movement, basically making out Israel to be an oppressor against a besieged minority, even though we all know from our education on this issue that that's not the case. But they've managed to create this narrative. And so now it's really our turn to be able to answer that narrative and to be equipped and to have pride in our ability to you know, tell them that they're wrong. And I think an integral part of that is stating very clearly that there is no distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And Dali's answer illustrates that in many ways as well, that Zionism is integral to the Jewish people. It's the right of the Jewish people to live in their land. So this is merely just a form of anti-Semitism disguised under this language, because unfortunately the anti-Semites are clever. Thank you, Zach. Right, I uh, I completely agree with everything Tamara said there. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not about the Palestinians. If it were, then the anti-Zionists would have a problem with the Islamic Jihad killing civilians. Um, I think that that what, what, what Tamara says there, that the goal of anti-Semitism is to make the Jews, to marginalize the Jews, also to make the Jews the enemy, right? To, uh, to fascists, we were communists. To communists, we were uh, you know, uh, obscene capitalists, right? Uh, to every group imaginable, we are their enemy. And this is just another version of that. Now, I do want to just briefly explain, I think, because I don't think I have much else to add uh, after these two and their great explanations of the overlap between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. I do want to talk a little bit about how anti-Zionism fits into the campus progressive worldview that you'll encounter. Um, so, generally speaking, uh, there is this sort of uh, racial essentialism that's, that's taken hold in the progressive movement. Uh, either you are uh, white and the oppressor or black and the oppressed and all the other racial categorizations are for the most part kind of ignored in this dichotomy. Um, and uh, that says all it needs to say about you. Everybody from this group is the same. They can all be taken as one. If you share certain characteristics, you are by definition an oppressor. Uh, and how this goes out to sort of Israel-Palestine and by extension anti-Semitism, because that really is what the new form of anti-Semitism is, as Tamara said, uh, 
It sees the Jews in Israel as white and the oppressor and the Palestinians as the oppressed racial minority. In their eyes, I think the best way to explain it is Israelis are the police and the Palestinians are George Floyd. That is probably, I think, the best way to characterize the sort of thinking that you'll see on college campuses. And so, and I think we'll probably cover uh, some of this. Uh, it's almost impossible to separate those two when you're talking to someone on campus who does believe these sorts of things. Uh, it's almost as though they take as religious gospel the racial essentialism, and so it's impossible, I think, to really change their minds about that. What is possible, though, is to grab people on the periphery, right? That's where I think education can actually work. There are people who, you know, just by virtue of hanging out with progressives, are going to agree with the stuff they're saying. And uh, if they have a little bit more information about Israel, about Zionism, about the history of anti-Semitism, may change their mind. I've actually had that experience before. Friends of mine who were opposed to Zionism, once I explained the history of it to them, changed their mind. So it's not as though all hope is lost, right, even though these uh, progressive activists have fully bought into, you know, uh, what I would consider almost a, a new sort of civic religion. Uh, though they're not really touchable, there are other people who are, and we've had real success uh, on that front. Okay, thank you, Zach. <clears throat> With this last question, we'll round out the panelist questions, and then after this, we'll open it to the young adults in the audience if they would like to ask a question as well. You know, God has mandated to our people that we should be or lagoim, that we should shine our light onto the other nations. And so it helps beg the question, is there a fundamental difference between the way we as Jews are expected to conduct ourselves on college campuses, on the streets, wherever we may find ourselves, relative to those that are non-Jewish? Can you share with the audience some of your experiences? Have you felt a difference as a Jew in terms of how you're expected to respond to certain experiences? Um, and what have you done in terms of showcasing to the rest of the world what it means to be a Jewish person and who we are as people that are trying to make this world a better place. Let's start with Zach. Sure. Um, you know, this actually reminds me of a conversation that uh, we were having. Uh, so I, uh, I'm also, uh, like tomorrow, associated with the Tigma Fund. I recently completed a summer fellowship with them and am a member of their uh, uh, college-aged uh, student discussion group as well as a committee working to fight campus anti-Semitism. And at our last meeting of that committee, uh, this was Monday night, we had a discussion basically to this effect. What kinds of strategies can we employ knowing that we are Jews and what we do as a group will be viewed through that lens, right? And so one of the things we were talking about, uh, you know, something that we could do, say, in relation to Israel Apartheid Week, which I, I know you have a lot of experience working uh, on that particular issue, uh, one of the things that we talked about was, well, could we have an, an event centered around what the enemies of Israel and of the Jewish people are really like? Right, talk about terror, talk about disregard for innocent lives, talk about anti-Semitism as the hatred that it is. And, you know, while all of that is true and all of that might be compelling to some people, someone brought up the unfortunate reality that we would be called, you know, bloodthirsty Zionists who are Islamophobic for doing that sort of thing. And that's the challenge, right? The, the question to figure out uh, is what audience are you appealing to? Uh, what type of message can you put out into the world based on that audience's reaction to you as a Jew? For, you know, do you want to go after, say, people who are on the progressive side? If you do, you probably won't be able to use that kind of messenger. So that really is, that, that's where being a Jew and being looked at as a Jew and being involved in campus activism comes into it. We would never be able to riot. We can't do that. Uh, not that we should want to, 
but even if we did want to, we wouldn't be able to, right? It would be held against us to an extent that it's not held against the defund the police uh, protesters at uh, schools. So, yeah, I think there is a pressure on us to be more civilized than that, which might be in effect actually a good thing because it motivates us to find good arguments, good strategies for messaging, uh, good lines of attack. But yes, there always is just this very conscious uh, uh, feeling that people are looking at you as a Jew and as a Zionist. Uh, I'll tell a, a brief story. I, uh, during spring of 2021, when violence flared up uh, in, in Israel and then in response in, in Gaza, I was seeing a lot of Instagram infographics, you know, with misleading information, uh, oftentimes crossing over from just criticism of Israel to pure old-fashioned anti-Semitism. And I, you know, I'm not a big, uh, I, I don't really post things on Instagram that have to do with this sort of thing, but I thought, you know, I'm not really seeing uh, really anyone posting anything in support of Israel. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, and so I did. I posted something on my Instagram story that said, uh, I support Israel's right to defend itself. And I got some positive feedback, and I got some very, very negative feedback. I got people who were calling me, you know, a, a supporter of genocide and of apartheid and, uh, and, and, and a settler colonialist and white supremacist and all the other academic sounding terms that they like to throw around that they think give them more credibility. And uh, that, that's an example, I think, of how being Jewish and being a Zionist just makes it different. Right? No one is going to, if you're posting something about really any other social cause, no one's going to angrily reply to your post and call you horrible things because you did. And so even that, even saying I support Israel's right to defend itself, was seen as a bridge too far for a lot of these progressive activist types. That's the difference. That's my answer to that question. Okay, thank you, Zach. With that, we're going to pause on this question. We'd like to give time for the audience to ask questions. So if anybody has any questions in the audience, we'd love to get to you and get to your questions. Okay, let's go to Fred. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering what the real reason is. I mean, in a theoretical world, if we were all able to move to Israel and really just ignore the public's opinion of it, because we don't want our friends and our families and ourselves to go through that type of hate living in a country that we want to live in. So if you choose to live here as a Jew and if you're proud of who you are, which I hope you are, and if you know your history and you know where you come from, do you really want to live in a place where it's not accepted, where it's not understood? 
So I think that's why public opinion matters. Can I add something very quickly? I think you have to do it for yourself. Even if you make the decision that, you know, for whatever reason, Dahlia's arguments don't persuade you, which I think they should, but you have to do it for yourself because you don't want to go through life negating what you believe, hiding what you believe, because you're afraid of how it's going to come out or you think it's futile. If you believe strongly that the Jewish people have a right to a Jewish state and that as a Jew you shouldn't be treated differently to anyone else, then you have to go through everything you do in life stating that proudly. Otherwise, it's going to begin to eat away at your own self-confidence and your own sense of self. That, that would be my answer. Good evening, guys. First, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Mike Logan, and I'm a rising sophomore at Harvard College. Um, this past April, we uh, during apartheid week, they put a giant wall in the middle of campus, in the middle, you know, where everybody can see it, um, called the apartheid wall, in which they compared quote, Palestinians to um, survivors of the Holocaust. They had imagery comparing um, the Palestinians in Auschwitz. Um, and the Jews to the Nazis, and then they said that anti that Zionism is white supremacy and Nazism. Um, after that, for the first time in history, the Harvard Crimson publicly endorsed BDS. And so naturally, um, as one of the student leaders at the Harvard Chabad, and very involved in Israel advocacy on campus, we worked hard to think of solutions and ways to combat that type of anti-Semitism on campus. And so of course, I'd be willing to discuss with you what we plan, but I'm curious to hear what you guys had in mind for the future, how to combat those types of anti-Semitism and those types of rhetoric that was discussed on campus. Yeah, sure, I'll take, I can take it. Thanks. Um, so first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I was following all that at Harvard pretty closely. Uh, actually, I, I'm acquainted with Natalie Kahn, who's on the Crimson, who wrote a fantastic op-ed about it. Um, so I think there are two strategies to take here. Uh, one would be the on-campus strategy, and one would be the off-campus one. Uh, on-campus, I think it's probably best not to respond to something like that. I, I think that you know, he, who, uh, he who chooses the terms of the debate wins the debate. So I don't think it is worth engaging with those sorts of spur uh, spurious claims about Israel. I don't think that the people putting that stuff on are really going to listen if you do engage with facts. What I do think is possible, uh, and Dahlia can talk about this, uh, is doing your own thing, right? Uh, is it, uh, oh, Hebrew, Hebrew Liberation League, right? Uh, so that's doing a separate thing, talking about Jewish history, talking about the value of Israel for the Jewish people, not just talking about Israel being a tech hub and how good falafel is and doing Israeli dance classes, but the actual substance of the issue, that is what could actually have an impact on campus. Now, the other tactic that you could go with is outside. Uh, so I'll give you an, an example. When I was, uh, right, so I told you that story about the slogan being painted on the rock in Northwestern. Uh, I, when that happened, you know, took a picture of it, did a Twitter thread about it that got some traction, ultimately ended up writing a piece about it. Um, and that's how you raise awareness outside. And what that does is that gets people who keep up with these sorts of issues uh, to notice and to contact your university and to make sure that they don't adopt any policies uh, that are anti-Semitic, right? That's happened when certain universities have been in the process of adopting BDS resolutions. Uh, for North, in Northwestern's case, the administration was never going to put out a statement about it because they're, to be honest, afraid of the student activists. But, but I do think outside pressure is one of the reasons that they, amid many attempts to have a university-wide recognition of Israel as an apartheid state and a university-wide acceptance of BDS, this happened probably three or four times over the past five or so years. The university has never caved in, and it's because a lot of their alumni and donors have gotten on their back about it. So that's that's sort of uh, path two. I'm just going to add. Um, so first of all, I think it's extremely important to recognize that none of us here knows Harvard as well as you do. Every campus is very different, and I think the strategy should be aligned with your campus. 
So I'm going to talk about my experience. The wall you described, we have we have every year. Uh, I was specifically called a Nazi because I served in the army, so I completely have been there. <laughs> um, and I, what we when he mentioned Zach, Hebrew liberation, because something that we started actually as a reaction uh, to Israel Apartheid Week, and I think I personally think it's a it's a fair game. I mean. Think about the people, the 80% usually, more or less, that you know that are unaware of Israel, have never heard of Israel, don't care about Israel. I love people who don't care about Israel, it's easier. Um, really. But if the only thing they see is Israel Apartheid Week, even if they don't stop to talk to them, even if they don't read what's on that wall, that's the only thing they see, that's our loss. So what we decided to do is put something right in front, not because we want to convince them, we're never going to convince them, it's doesn't matter. But those people who walk by, even if they don't talk to us, which many do, at least they understand that there's another version to this story. And that's why I do believe that something should be done. But what we did as well, which I think is extremely important, as I mentioned earlier, we need to reclaim our own narrative. So what we did is we started doing it regardless of apartheid week. We had it both semesters. So we had it while apartheid week, but we also had it on our own to make sure they understand that we don't celebrate our identity because they hate us. We celebrate our, our identity because we strongly believe in it and know it and appreciate it. So I think that's also a very important component of that. Um, and to that, I also want to say to all of you, it's very easy to doubt your history, your identity, who you are, your Zionism, unless you really know where it's coming from. So it's kind of homework before college, but try to make sure that you do your own investigation, that you research on your own who you are and your identity to make sure that when you hear things from professors, from other students that will make you doubt, you will be confident enough that you know. You know because you checked, you know because you thought about it, you know because you researched, not because someone else told you. Because so many Jews on campus, again, every campus is different, I don't want to scare you, there are so many campuses that are really different, but. So many Jews come and say, you know, I've been lied to my whole childhood. I've been, you know, I've been raised in this place where I've been told Israel is great, but now I find out the truth. You need to find out the truth. You don't need anyone else to tell it for you. So that's another addition to that. and they realize you know what you're talking about and facts matter. Um, but again, I feel like once you are connected to who you are and you know the reasons that you're doing what you're doing, then you can also touch upon you know, the emotional signs of what that means to you. When they are playing on emotional things, kind of like what Zach said earlier, if they see um, you know, the, the police as the Israeli army and Palestinians as the black people here, and, or, or as George Floyd, that's a very emotional reaction. That's what they're trying to do. So if we can tell our story in a way that will sell, it's kind of like sales. Find what moves the person in front of you. Israel has it all to offer. So find what moves the person in front of you and attack the issue through that. 
Um, and that's something that I try to do whenever I have those debates on campus. I try to understand who it is that stands in front of me through a few questions, and then talk to them about Israel from that lens. Uh, so that would be my advice. If I could just add a few things. So I think everything Dahlia said is really important. That's where you should start. You should start by you know finding what moves the other person engaging, don't just take yourself out of the equation and disengage from the debate, even if you feel like facts aren't gonna win them over, you have to stay in the fight. You can't show that you uh, feel like your side isn't worth fighting for. But I'll say two other things as well. I think that something you can do is take the conversation elsewhere by basically having fun with your Jewish identity. So that could be either hosting a party, something that I did personally on campus before I started my full-time work was um, we hosted big parties each year. We would call them Tel Aviv Takes London. And basically these would become some of the biggest events for students on campus, no matter whether they were Jewish or not. And it's attractive to see Jews being able to take pride in Israel to play Israeli music, you know, to have Israeli food, so on and so forth. The other element of having fun with your identity, something that Tikva does, is to host reading groups on different campuses across the country um, as part of the Collegiate Forum. Um, so something that we would do um, over the next, over the coming year, for example, if we have a student that wants to run it is basically have students have the tools to uh, to look at Jewish texts, to look at things from Dara Horn, who I mentioned earlier, basically to educate your fellow peers about anti-Semitism on your own terms. So to host something that's not just responsive to the Palestinian side or to the anti-peace side, but to actually host something that is really just for you, for your personal relationship with your Jewish identity from an intellectual excuse me, intellectual perspective, and to basically give you give you the filler that you need for your why, because ultimately your why is gonna come from your internal relationship to your Judaism, to Israel. It's not gonna come from always being on the defensive, it's gonna come from celebrating and being positive. So I think, you know, I hope, I hope some of those answers are helpful, and I just, to all of you, I mean, I just wanna commend you for the fact that you're in this and you're asking the right questions because you're really starting from a good point if you're saying, what can I do? Um, I really have faith that you're gonna, you're gonna find a way. Hi, I'm Joe Gindy. Uh, I just had a quick question for, I guess, all three of you. Zach, you mentioned earlier in your, I guess, opening speech how when you wrote that article talking about anti-Semitism, people mixed it up with anti-Zionism, and you understood that to be anti-Semitism. Does that mean, I turned off, but does that mean that not all anti-Zionism, or at least not the majority of anti-Zionism is necessarily anti-Semitic? Well, I got a, uh, First of all, I clarify, I think, what I said earlier. So the, the response to my piece said that I, by conflating anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, was being myself anti-Semitic. Oh, so I, thought, I thought you meant right. that you said that. But I will, I'll address the second part of that, though. I think that I agree uh, with the other two speakers that in almost all of his manifestations, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. I guess you can make an exception for, like, Sahar Jews who oppose Israel because they think it's forcing the coming of the Messiah. Uh, so that, that I guess is, a, is, is, an, is an exception to that. Um, but I guess in that case, they also are working toward similar ends as the anti-Semites, so maybe not. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that in almost all cases, they're one of the same. Okay. Not only have I experienced, I guess, kind of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism by not my not Jewish peers, but I have experienced a lot of anti-Zionist um, kind of thoughts and discussions from my friends who are Jewish and have those anti-Zionist ideologies. Um, how would you recommend, like, kind of going about having a conversation like that? Or, kind of just like general advice, because I struggle with that kind of thing, just because I can't really make the anti-Semitic argument against that. Um, 
Um, okay, well, first of all, I'm sorry um, to hear, but again, it is what it is, and I'm glad that you're asking what to do because it means you care. Um, well, first of all, as Zach shared about his Hillel, I can share about my Hillel at my time. I'm sure things change with time, but it's similar. Like, they were actively trying to make sure that we don't open as a student group, for example, because we were raffling too many feathers. Um, so sometimes it is an issue that we need to handle about our own. Um, and I don't think you need to call them anti-Semitic, especially if they're Jewish, but I think it's important to point out what's anti-Semitic and the claims, and I think that's okay. Um, I think that it's part of like what I said earlier about learning and understanding deeply on your own. What what are the facts and what are the things and what are what is that history that we're talking about? What is that connection that we're talking about to Israel? And then trying to explain it that it's theirs as well. I mean, they're part of the people, and it's part of it's also a connection that they have. Um, I think that remaining a friend with someone you disagree with is critically important for two main reasons. First of all, it makes sure that they keep, still hear you and they hear your point of view, but it's also extremely important for all of you to know what's out there, <laughs> what people are saying, what, they're, what we need to understand what we're facing in a way. So I would highly recommend through friendship and through kindness trying to um, figure it out on your own, you know, the, the, the factors that make you who you are, that make you the Zionist that you are, that makes the connection that you have and then try and bring it to them as well uh, in the best way that you can. Personally, if you can, bring them to Israel. <laughs> that's the best way. Um, but I think, I think that's what I would do. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Joe Mastery. Um, I'm like, gonna be attending Brooklyn College next semester. And um, you know, it's not the most, it's pretty anti-Semitic or whatever. It's a great hello. Good hello there. Um, but you know, it's anti-Semitic in a lot of ways, like people, going into classes with Jewish professors and dropping it last minute, a lot of anti-Semitic. And I, I've been talking to some of my friends who are already in college, and they say like, yeah, avoid this professor if you're a Jew, like she's gonna like fail you or whatever it is. You know, so I feel like there's a little bit of fear there to maybe be more outgoing and uh, the, again, in the fight against anti-Semitism because you know, it could also affect your career or your grades in college. And maybe staying more quieter would be a better approach so I'm not having that effect you. So how would you recommend having a balance to where it doesn't get to the point where it starts affecting you in college? So I think the important thing to do in this scenario is to remember that there are outside organizations that come in, can come in and provide you with some help. In a situation like that, when you have a professor that is discriminating against students because they're Jewish, because of their opinions, at this point, that's unlawful. It's illegal. It's against the law. It's not something that should be happening. And there's work that you can do on campus to fight against that, but it comes to a point where actually a lawsuit might need to be filed. And this is something that's going on in a few different colleges in New York, NYU, and other places. And essentially what it will mean is that it will force the university to be held accountable and to do what the law says, which is to ensure that every student on campus has the equal opportunity to succeed. And so what does that mean for you? That means that if you see a situation in which a professor is doing something that they are discriminating against you because you said in a class about world history that you know Israel has a right to exist, whatever it may be, you should document what has been said. That's your role, and you should have people outside come in who are professionals and do something about the situation. If it's at the point where this is a known professor that is doing this to student after student, it's not something that you can just let slide. It's something that's illegal. And I think just in general, as students, you have to know when it's something that you can take on yourself and when it's something that you actually need to say, this is bigger than just me. This is a legacy for the institution that's going to live on. We actually need to document everything, write everything down, and bring this to a lawyer, bring this to an institution that could help. And there are plenty. I'm happy to you know, give names if you want to chat about it afterwards. Samara, I just want to interrupt. The yeah. FCA also has a lawyer on our board, Gita Kaplan, who if anyone has any complaints that you think it's illegal, that you're worrying that it's illegal, she's on our board, she can answer any of those questions, she's connected with the Lawfare Project, and she's a great resource. So that's that's absolutely who you should talk to. Okay, I'll, uh, 
can I get a quick follow yeah, up on ahead. that? Um, on, on the on the lawsuit option, I do want to say that uh, so around the time the Civil Rights Act was passed, something like ninety percent of white Americans uh, were were not comfortable living next door to a black family. Now that number is less than ten percent. So I think that once you establish that something is not okay under the law, public sentiment can change pretty fast. Right? Once there's no longer a permission structure in terms of its legality, I think people learn quickly that they can't behave like that. Um, I also want to say that, uh, as to the part of your question about you know, worrying about facing consequences uh, and all that, I don't think that everyone who's involved in this fight has to be involved in it in the same way. Right? Not everyone has to be holding up signs at a protest. Uh, and, some people can, you know, I'm not a protester, I write instead. Not everyone has to write, some people can protest. Some people can uh, organize groups of people to hold events. Uh, it's whatever, whatever your strengths uh, would uh, have you be more inclined uh, to do is how you should be involved. Right? There's, no, there's no one way. Awesome. Um, our last question is from our host, Dave Tadef, and then I guess it would be amazing if the panelists would mingle. Anyone who didn't get a chance to ask your questions, you could reach them that way. Thank you so much, David. Uh, yeah, well, you, uh, by the way, you all spoke phenomenal tonight. So, um, some of the questions, you, you already answered some of my other uh, questions that I wanted to ask, but especially just now. Um, like, my daughter's in school, and they, they come from a small community, and um, not always are they put into a situation where they're uh, when they're talking, to, when they're talking to someone that's anti-Semitic, or they get into that conversation, and that could go a whole year without that happening. So when they do go to school, and a lot of them go to school for the first time, if you want them to be proactive, and they leave tonight saying, "I'm going to go to school, and I'm going I'm to do this," what would you recommend them to do? Do want to go down the line? Um. Well. I think that first of all, once, I think it's actually the opening question that we have, finding the reason of why you want to do what you want to do. And I think that once you find a reason of why you want to do it, then you can understand what way is best for you. Kind of like what Zach said earlier, we're not the same, all of us. Each and every one of us has our own specialty and our own thing that we do best. Um, so I think that maybe what I would tell them what you should do tonight is realize what it is that you do best and why it is that you want to do it. Um, and then go ahead and, and research and figure it out on your own because when you're going to be on the other side of the country or around or after the river in New York, um, you're kind of on your own and that's a great opportunity and an amazing thing and you're going to experience really incredible things in college. It's really the best time. Um, but it's also a time where you have to handle for the first time things on your own, and that's okay. And I think you're only going to grow stronger and better from there. Um, and kind of like I shouted to the person who's going to Brooklyn, there are places where you're going to have a great support system. So don't be worried, and you'll always find your people. I mean, I think one of the best things that came out of the college experience for me is actually the group that I have with me. One of my best, few of my best friends still are, are from that group of people. So. Don't let it, you know, scare you off, or, or don't be fearful. It's, it's all going to be good. It's, you're only going to become stronger and better for standing up for what you believe in. Okay, and with that, we'd like to conclude tonight's program. Thank you to our panelists. You're amazing. Thank you again to the event family for opening up their home and allowing for this program to take place. And thank you all of you for coming tonight. We hope it was meaningful. Everybody have a wonderful night.